Hi, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. Emily Einstein with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Office of Science Policy and Communication. With me today, we have the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Dr. Nora Volkoff, and tobacco expert, Dr. Heather Kimmel. We're excited to share with you what NIH is doing in this space, but first, let's turn to our panelists to, to start the discussion. Dr. Volkoff, how big a problem is vaping for the health of the country? Actually, uh, good morning. Thanks for having me here. And uh, vaping is of concern because it's actually, first of all, a relatively new technology, and yet we're seeing it being taken up very, very rapidly across all ages. And, um, and it, so therefore, we don't completely understand uh, ultimately how it's going to be used. Uh, but what we know already is that, first of all, there initially there was a lot of excitement by the fact that by vaping you may be able to help people stop smoking, and that is one aspect of, of vaping that is necessary to look into. But in the meantime, many more people are vaping that were otherwise not smoking, and therefore one of the concerns has been whether vaping, when you use it for nicotine, could actually uh, increase the risk of people then trans uh, transitioning into combustible tobacco. The other issue that we do not really know is that to what extent introducing chemicals that are part of the, the electronic cigarette itself may actually be toxic to the body. And because there, until now there has been very limited regulation in how you manufacture these uh, electronic devices, uh, there's very poor con chemi control of quality and you are exposing uh, certain of these instruments are exposing people to toxic substances. So that's the second element. And the third issue of concern has to do with the fact that you are introducing a vaping device. The only thing that it's doing is heating the substance. And so you are introducing vapor at very, very high temperatures. And that by itself can be damaging to the respiratory tract. And in order to actually deliver the substance, you have to combine it with other chemicals that by themselves also may have ir irritants and produce inflammatory process into the respiratory tract. And then, and I think that um, Dr. Kimmel is going to be an answering this question, is that the notion is these vaping devices is, are really devices for administering drugs in very effective ways. What you're doing is delivering them directly into the lungs, and the lung is this massive organ that is surrounded by blood vessels that immediately absorbs the drug. So it gets into your brain very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So you get much higher and faster concentrations into the brain than by other routes of administration other than smoking. If you smoke, you get the same effect. Um, so that in and of itself is going to make a drug more dangerous as it relates to its addictiveness. So these four characteristics of vaping devices are one of the issues why we need to be concerned about it and why have, we have to look carefully at uh, regulating quality and ensuring that people that are at risk don't uh, get exposed to them. I think one of the other issues too is that we really don't know what the long-term effects of vaping are. And we have some idea of what happened um, in short-term exposure. We really don't know when people use um, these devices multiple times a day, many days a week, many days throughout the year, what kind of an effect that's going to have on the respiratory system or other parts of the body. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a fairly new technology, so we yes. just don't know. Right. What, what uh, we have been seeing and the manufacturers have been seeing is that you are delivering these devices with a whole host of extraordinary appealing flavors. So mm -hmm. that's very attractive to young people mm -hmm. and makes you, gives you the sense sort of belief that these things are safe. So uh, in the, at the beginning, I mean, last year, we basically were asking for the first time when you vape, what do you think you are vaping? Mm -hmm. And most teenagers stated that they thought they were vaping only flavors. Now, but 11% said that they were vaping nicotine. The issue is that when one uh, basically, one looks at it more carefully, one finds out they didn't really know what they were vaping. Exactly. And second, devices that tell you this device does not have nicotine, when well, their studies have actually evaluated, found that 17% of them, in fact, had nicotine when they were advertising as not nicotine. Mm -hmm. So there is that other element that can, without the person realizing them, make them condition to these products, either by their flavors, which are creating these strong memories that you want, that actually makes you desire them, or through the nicotine, which okay. further enhances the conditioning. Right, exactly. And the most popular kind of vape pen doesn't even offer options that don't have nicotine. So the idea that it's just flavoring is perhaps not true. So let's get a little bit deeper into what exactly is in the vaping liquid, mm -hmm. and is that the same as what's in the vapor? And then what do these things do to the brain and the body? 
So the vaping liquid does not contain nearly the same number of chemicals as we would find in combustible tobacco products. Mm -hmm. However, one issue is that although many of these chemicals are labeled as gen generally recognized as safe, or GRAS, by the FDA, they're generally recognized as safe for ingestion in food, but not necessarily to be inhaled as a vapor. So again, this is one of those cases where we really don't know what the long-term effects of exposure to these chemicals are in vapor. In addition, there are other chemicals in the vapor, such as diacetyl, which has already been shown to to um, produce very serious and chronic pulmonary effects, uh, meaning effects on the lungs in people that are exposed to this. So we have those kinds of chemicals that are found in vapor. In addition, because the delivery device is an electronic product, it's a metal product, oftentimes in the vapor you will find various metals. And so these users are actually being exposed to different metals when they're using these products as well. Yeah, no, and I think that the, the issue that is important, again, to recognize why, because exactly of this, it's so very important to establish standards of quality on these devices, because that will can determine if you start right. to control and regulate that these devices will not have, uh, that they have to demonstrate that they are safe. But um, I think that at the same time, what's interesting is, of course, the manufacturers are saying, no, the, the vaping devices are very, very safe and they can actually protect from the harmful mm -hmm. effects of tobacco smoke. And there is truth in each one of them. I mean, there is truth in that there may be less carcinogenic compounds overall, but there is not complete truth in the fact that these, the sense that these devices are safe. No, they do have chemicals that can produce untoward effects. And, and another issue too is that even though the FDA is starting to regulate these products, um, both the devices and the vaping liquid, the labels are not necessarily accurate. There's still a lot of mislabeling that goes on. So in some cases, products will say they contain no nicotine, and they actually do contain nicotine, or they contain much higher levels or much lower levels of nicotine that are on the label. So until we can work through these regula regulatory issues, you can't really depend on the label to tell you what's in the product. And I think it's an interesting thing to keep in mind that the vapor that comes out of these doesn't smell the same way that cigarette smoke smells. So mm -hmm. it sort of gives the impression that it doesn't have dangerous things in it. Okay. But it's a great point that there are other chemicals involved and that mm -hmm. there are also possible heavy metal exposures involved as well. But, and I, it's good that you mentioned this because it's one of the things that is clearly has made them also attractive is that you can vape and nobody will notice that you're vaping. <laughs> and so in the past where someone was compelled to not be able to lit a cigarette because they actually will notice when someone was smoking, then that issue is no longer pertinent. And you're seeing that, right. for example, among teenagers. Teenagers are telling you. I mean, mm -hmm. my, my friends are vaping in the middle of class because nobody can pick it up. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there is the element of ha not having a smell, which also relates not just for nicotine, but also for marijuana, where you can smell when someone is actually smoking marijuana, but when mm -hmm. someone is vo vaping 9-THC, you can't. Exactly. So it lacks both the social pressure and the detectability. So vaping is often referred to as a tool to quit smoking cigarettes. Does the research support this? And do we know whether it's less harmful than smoking? I think this is, again, one of those areas that immediately has polarized the field. It's so interesting because we want to look at things terrible or this is the salvation, the best thing that has ever happened to us. But if you look at it uh, in a critical way, you can see, and there is evidence that on individuals that have had difficulty on quitting smoking, that have tried multiple methods, uh, vaping may provide them a mechanism by which they can actually decrease the consumption of those products. And there is data that at the individual level, when you look at particular patient types, it can have benefit. At the same time, when you look at it in terms of the overall population and says you can actually forget about any harmful effects, then you face the other aspect if just opening up access to um, nicotine vaping devices may then, and we know we also have data to show this, if you start vaping as an adult and uh, nicotine and you follow them longitudinally, prospectively, the risk of becoming, um, starting to get uh, smoking uh, tobacco is much greater. So studies have shown, yes, there is benefit for patients that are, have not been able to stop other way, but all studies have also shown that 
If you were not addicted to tobacco and you started vaping, then your risk of transitioning into a combustible tobacco is significantly higher. And so here you have evidence of two realities, something that could be in certain instances beneficial and something that clearly without that context could be very harmful. And I want to add to this that um, right now the FDA does not recognize e-cigarettes as um, a legitimate um, cessation device. There are other ways to help reduce or quit smoking, but right now the FDA does not recognize e-cigarettes or related vaping devices as very, one of those products. Very, very important point, and I think that, I mean, that the studies have to be done, the randomized clinical trials have to be done to actually demonstrate the right. outcomes that are necessary mm -hmm. for the FDA to recognize that uh, this is an indication for smoking cessation. Right. So, and we, of course, as an institute, we're very interested on in seeing those trials being done. And uh, it will also, for those trials, of course, it will be important to actually standardize the device that you're going yeah. to be using because uh, devices are not synonymous with one another and there right. are significant differences. So, but absolutely, and I'm glad you are bringing it up, we do need more research. Yes, absolutely. So while these devices we still don't know but could potentially have utility to help some populations quit, let's talk a little bit about how vaping affects young people. So we've discussed that vaping is very popular among teens. What are some of the specific issues for that population? Well, the teenagers are particularly um, vulnerable to exposures to drugs and to the appeal of, of new technologies and salient stimuli. <laughs> and, and I think that vaping devices have really maximized the slickness of their products. So here mm -hmm. you have a product that is really, some of the products are very, very appealing, even to my yeah. eye. On top of that, they have all of these really um, appealing flavors also to my brain. I, I imagine those of adolescents. So, and you see the other kids doing it, and you see it in social media. So as an adolescent, you are very prone to learning and, be, and wanting to be from others and wanting to be part of that group and be cool. And so by, through social media or through in parties where you see it, it becomes the norm. And so you, of course, want to, and, and, t and kids endorse that. They, they do it because they want to have a good time with their friends. But the other component that we have to be mindful in adolescence is that the brain is still developing. And it will continue to develop actually until they are in their early 20s. And, and what that means is that the brain of an adult is different from that of an adolescent. And, and it is the experiences in life through those adolescent years that ultimately will fixate more or less because the brain still continues to, to change as we're adults, but not as, as, as markedly. Um, so that you are prepared to optimize um, your performance in a given environment. So that's why the brain takes so long in developing, to maximize the likelihood that you will have a brain structure and architecture and function that will be optimal for your environment. And the problem is that drugs disturb that architecture and that development. And while, um, I mean, vaping nicotine, uh, nicotine is a very active substance in the brain. Mm. And we have the receptors that are activated by nicotine appear very early on in development, just like the receptors that are necessary for cannabis to exert its effects appear very, very early on in development. And we know that both nicotine and the cannabinoid, these cannabinoid receptors that are activated by marijuana are necessary for brain development. So the concern is that by exposing teenagers when their brain is in full development to these substances, you will disrupt that developmental trajectory. Mm. And we do know also, lots of work has been done there, that the younger you start taking a drug, the greater the likelihood that you will become addicted. So if, you, if, if kids would have not smoked cigarettes because the level of smoking is so very low among teenagers, combustible, but then they, now that they are taking nicotine through vaping, does that put them at higher risk of addiction because they are getting exposed to the nicotine very mm -hmm. early on in life? And so I actually we're seeing pretty high levels of rate of use on eighth graders, and on Monday we'll know exactly the numbers, what they are, but eighth graders already are having significant uh, utilization of vaping. So that, those are some of the important aspects why we need to be so particularly concerned about vaping among teenagers. And generally we found at night or two that if children are exposed to different drugs in, when they're younger, then it puts them at risk for using those 
something to make it all but also using other substances Absolutely. as well. Yeah. So then so you put in this kit that you could potentially to use nicotine as well as other substances. And so that becomes an issue in and of itself. And in addition, um, the vaping devices are oftentimes used to vape nicotine, as we've discussed, um, flavoring, but they can also be used to vape other substances like cannabis or marijuana. So they kind of opens up another avenue, another route of delivery for these kids to take these different drugs. Yes, I mean, so it is, you have diversity, you have a very appealing product, and you have a very easy transition because you may want to actually just do it for the flavor of curiosity. On Benos to New, that, uh, that uh, device that you're taking has nicotine and you immediately get conditioned. Mm -hmm. Or even if you are not, has nicotine, it, once you start to uh, use it and you try it and says, well, what's the big deal? <laughs> then when someone offers you one with nicotine, I'm sort of, you've already done this. I mean, the way that the brain works is you're sort of daring, daring more and more. I mean, we go I incrementally. So these are uh, some of the issues of why we're taking very seriously the patterns and the very fast uptake of the vaping de mm -hmm. devices by teenagers. Excellent. So why don't we open it up to questions from our viewers? Um, someone wrote in to say that they have seen it stated that vaping um, causes people to start smoking who may never have smoked before. Do you have any information from scientific research about that? There, there are a couple of studies that, as I mentioned before, that have been done actually prospectively, where they evaluated a group of people that, that this was done in adults who actually were vaping versus those that were not vaping and who had not been exposed to, uh, to tobacco or those who have been exposed to uh, combustible tobacco that started vaping to see if that will lead them to decrease their smoking. And what they found was those that in subsequent years, those that were starting by vaping were more likely to be using combustible tobacco. But they also saw that those that were smoking tab combustible, combustible tobacco and then went to into vaping <clears throat> did not stop, but actually used to combine both mm -hmm. products. And, 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 and certainly, I mean, you need to expand. I mean, the, as I mentioned, there are two or three studies, but there is evidence that at least one to be concerned about it, and again, the, to my knowledge, there are no studies in adolescents, uh, but based on what these studies are showing in adults, I mean, it, it, you cannot ignore the possibility that as teenagers get exposed to nicotine by vaping, that also may increase their, their risk of then transitioning into um, smoking tobacco. And we need to do those studies to evaluate and to understand the level of risk. So what do we know about patterns of co-use, such as using um, alcohol while vaping, and how could this maybe change risk profiles or health outcomes? Well, I think generally, as we mentioned before, when you use one drug, you have a tendency to use other drugs, partly because of the social environment surrounding one, the use of one drug. Also, I think it sort of normalizes that drug behavior, and so you think, oh, this isn't so bad, so I can try something else. So I think we've looked at um, co-use patterns, as you mentioned, and there's not only co-use patterns between different types of products, so tobacco products and alcohol, but also within the landscape of tobacco products. Now we have many, many different products. We were just discussing this phenomenon of using combustible products along with vaping, but then a lot of people will also use um, cigars, cigarillos, and hookah as another product that's really sort of coming to the mainstream, particularly for young people in recent years. And so people do tend to use multiple products. Um, when they start using one. Mm -hmm. but, but I think w another aspect about the issue of the vaping devices is that you have a cartridge, and that gives you the opportunity to generate a cocktail. So in the mm -hmm. cartridge, you can put not just nicotine, but you can combine alcohol. So you now can mm -hmm. vape alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even though vaping of alcohol through these devices is still not, is not very frequent, one can see it um, perhaps increasing. Like it was not very frequent initially to see vaping of uh, 90 HC, and now we see it more frequently. So now you can start to think about doing drug combinations. And I, I predict that that is something that perhaps in the future we'll start to see more. And then when you start to combine drugs like that, and certainly as uh, Schimmel was saying, there is very frequent, is more frequent than the exception that people drink and smoke, mm -hmm. and, and when they smoke marijuana, they smoke nicotine, or they combine drugs. But, but usually, sometimes what happens is sequentially, and what we don't necessarily know sometimes is when you are directly combining them and administering it at the same mm -hmm. time at a very high 
in a route of administration that's going to lead to very, very high concentrations of both very rapidly. Mm -hmm. That is an aspect that, um, that we'll start to see. I mean, because that's, I mean, already we know from the epidemiological studies, but we do not completely understand, no, we don't, don't know. I mean, we are going to be surprised about what people are going to be combining, but we need to keep an eye on that. Absolutely, and route of administration matters so much for drug effects, so if people are vaping alcohol instead of ingesting it, the effects could be quite different. Yes, yes indeed, and they yeah. come up uh, faster, because again, mm -hmm. the, that concept of you go from your lungs, from your lungs it goes directly to your left heart, and the left heart blood goes directly into your brain. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take it oral, you have completely. to go to the stomach, and then from the stomach it's absorbed, then it basically goes to the liver, and then it goes uh, into the pulmonary circulation. So it's a much, much slower process than when you right. take it uh, vape. Absolutely. All right, someone has asked, every day people are dying from fentanyl. Why is that not an epidemic, but vaping that has killed no one is? I would say that, uh, I mean, we call the opioid epidemic crisis and that uh, the issue we don't call the fentanyl epidemic because fentanyl is extremely important in this epidemic, but it's not the only one. So we have prescription opioids, we have heroin, and we have fentanyl and its analogs, and it's devastating, and it's clearly an epidemic. The fact that we call one epidemic doesn't mean we cannot have another epidemic and it'll be wonderful that we will not uh, right now having to address these issues of uh, the, epi the epidemic from the opioid crisis. I think that uh, the, what we need to recognize with respect to the vaping is that, again, and it has taken us by surprise because it's a new technology, so we didn't know how it was going to be accepted, just like cell phone took off, so mm -hmm. are these vaping devices taking off. And, um, and cell phones, of course, have mostly very positive effects. And with the vaping, while there may be potential benefits uh, perhaps in people to f smoking cessations that cannot uh, stop otherwise, we are starting to recognize that there's potential of misuse of these mm -hmm. devices that can have ill intended consequences. And the concern is because it's been taken up so rapidly by young people right. that who are the most vulnerable that we cannot ignore it. Exactly. And that rapid uptake is a very important point. To have an epidemic, it's, it's not related to mortality or people dying. It's related to the, the rate of increase. And so it's been a very rapid rate of increase of vaping. Someone else has asked, what are the chemicals involved in vaping? We've touched on that a bit. But mm -hmm. but there, there are many um, chemicals involved in, in vaping. Um, for example, propylene glycol is one of the most um, common solvent mm -hmm. used as, a, as kind of the base liquid. We can find all sorts of chemicals in vaping. One thing that's important to recognize is that the flavors that are in vaping are actually manufactured by chemicals to provide the sensation of that particular flavor. So for example, you may have a vaping liquid that's labeled margarita. It's not as though someone actually took a margarita and put it in the vaping liquid, but they put together a combination of chemicals in that liquid to provide the sensation of that, um, that um, feeling of taking, yeah. right, the feeling that you're drinking a margarita. And so there are many, many liquids and many more than we can possibly um, go, through, go through here in terms of the ingredients of the vaping liquid. Um, one thing to recognize too is that some of these they, some of these um, chemicals in the vaping liquids, as we talked about before, are generally recognized as safe to be ingested. But some of them we do know actually have carcinogenic properties, meaning that they can actually cause cancer if the taken in if they're um, vaped or used um, in high enough quantities for long enough periods of time. Again, we don't quite know enough about the long-term effects of using these chemicals, but this is giving you some examples of the chemicals that are in the vaping liquid. And you're saying something, Himmel, that I think um, mentions uh, worthwhile uh, looking into because, I mean, uh, as stating, one of the issues that characterizes addiction, so if you become addicted to vaping nicotine, what mm -hmm. it means is compulsive escalation of uh, that behavior. Mm -hmm. So by default, these individuals that become addicted to nicotine and are vaping are going to be consuming huge quantities. So right. something that may be okay to inhale once in a while right. may not be okay to inhale when you are doing it throughout the whole day, mm -hmm. day after day after day. And I, I think that that compulsive repetitive patterns of behavior that characterizing addiction is likely to be responsible for what we will see a lot of that toxicity with these Absolutely. devices. Absolutely. That it will be chronic and it will be actually a very frequent, constantly throughout the day. Right. right. Someone else has asked if there was a faster drop off in cigarette use as use of e-cigarettes has increased. 
And that question actually has been asked to in, in respect of um, we're seeing that some of the drugs uh, that, uh, and, and particularly in teenagers, when last year we had said that there were very, very low rates of drug use in teenagers in 2017. And the question was, could this be in part related to the fact that they are vaping? And we don't, I mean, th th we've seen that decreases in certainly, and I'm speaking again in, in, chill, in adolescents because it's, that's where we're seeing lower mm -hmm. levels. But um, in adults, we're not seeing, for example, decreases in drug use. In, in adults, we're seeing increases in marijuana use. We're seeing increases in use of opioids. The consumption of alcohol, high levels of alcohol consumption per binge or per drink is actually going up, not down. So we cannot say that there is a decrease in the pattern of drug use because of the vaping devices, because that's not what we're seeing in the adult population, and certainly not what we saw last year among teenagers, and plus the decreases in drug among teenagers actually preceded the uptake into the vaping. So these, are, these appear to be different processes going on. And I would, I would basically venture to say, based on the studies that we have in, in laboratory animals, that when you expose them to nicotine, and particularly, as Himmel said, when you expose mm -hmm. them early on in adolescence, it primes your brain not just to become addicted to nicotine, but it right. primes your brain to become addicted to other right. drugs. So the, the, the vaping may, in fact, may render your brain, if you're vaping nicotine, render your brain more vulnerable to the rewarding effects of mm -hmm. other drugs. This person has asked, why is nicotine exposure to ad in adolescence a bigger issue than alcohol? I wouldn't say that uh, nicotine exposure is a bigger issue than alcohol, and I think that we like to say which one is worse. Uh, I mean, certainly the problem with alcohol, if you look at it in, in terms of morbidity and mortality, the number one cause of morbidity and mortality among teenagers is one of the main causes is driven by alcohol intoxication. So driving under the influences, being in a car with someone else, actually engaging in very risky behaviors with very untoward consequences, increases in, in infectious diseases from uh, risky sexual practices. So the alcohol intoxication modifies the mental state of the adolescent, making them even more impulsive. So no, alcohol has very, very damaging effects. Nicotine, on the other hand, uh, the, has to be looked from a different view. First of all, if it does uh, create a risk for tobacco smoking, we do know that tobacco smoking decreases your uh, life expectancy because of its effects in cancer, because it actually affects multiple organs, not just right. the lungs, the heart, the blood vessels. It's, I think that there's basically not a single tissue in our body that's not affected, but it takes time. It's a chronic effect. So you won't see it immediately. You will see it when you turn 50, 60, and, and that is different from what you're seeing right now with alcohol in adolescence. But as I mentioned before, what we cannot ignore is that by uh, taking nicotine as an adolescent, you may be priming your brain to other drugs, and so it may facilitate you using alcohol or marijuana or right. other drugs in the future that then may have more of an immediate negative effect. Exactly. So the negative effects of alcohol are much more acute and easier to Correct. see, but the yeah. negative in effects adolescence, nic yes. in adolescents, yes. All right, one last question. Can you get addicted to vaping with non-nicotine liquid? I would say that, uh, I mean, and again, what is it that we call addiction and sort of like what I, I would say you call addiction when you engage in a pattern of compulsive behavior, repetitive mm -hmm. behavior that you, can, you cannot terminate even though you want to do it and that is associated with negative cause, consequences. And we don't know that that behavior, that compulsive pattern can mm -hmm. occur uh, for behaviors that don't have drugs. And we see it with gambling, mm -hmm. video gaming, with uh, compulsive eating. So it is, it, it is plausible that by getting conditioned to these very slick devices, you could get conditioned to the flavors, and then you are driven by actually that to repeat itself. And in that respect, uh, could it re uh, reach the behavioral disruption as addiction? I, I mean, potentially it could, but again, this is, I do not, I have not read, so I, I, I and I want to base my, my statements on evidence, I am not familiar with any paper that has published a case where clearly indicating that a person had become addicted to vaping of flavors with no drugs in them. But theoretically, it is plausible. And I, th I think one concern though is that the um, using the using the vaping like 
liquid vaping devices, even if it doesn't have nicotine in it, would normalize that behavior. So at some point along the way, if you do then start using nicotine, then it becomes a normalized behavior, and then exactly. you run into some of the issues that Dr. Bokamp was talking about. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists and all of yeah. you for your participation in today's discussion. We've mentioned a lot of research and data today, so please be sure to check the comments for resources and, of course, the NIDA website for more information, which is drugabuse.gov. Thank you.